do in class. So you have uh, a little bit of an archive there. All right, so uh, second chapter in our textbook, you know, the first one was kind of like an intro that's kind of gets you into what is really, you know, what what uh, intercultural communication is all about and kind of the need for it. The second chapter is really we're getting to the the core. What in the world is communication? What in the world is culture? How do we define those terms? You know, why is that important? And what in the world is cross-cultural or intercultural communication, or however you want to call it? And so uh, the chapter begins with discussion of human communication. Those of you who had a communication class before, maybe you had it with me, I don't know. Uh, it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward. This is a little bit of a repeat, okay? So the authors talk about communication and they say that um, you have to, in order to get to the, what is intercultural communication, you have to understand what is communication uh, in general. And there are different types of communication. Uh, basically, it is an ability to express uh, and share your feelings and ideas uh, from one person to another. It could be multiple people. Uh, it could be face to face. It could be through email. It could be through whatever medium there may be out there. But that's really all communication is. Uh, expressing yourself, sharing your feelings, sharing your thoughts, sharing your ideas with somebody else out there. Um, and that's just human communication. That's what we call interpersonal communication, okay? Uh, when we talk about communication, um, there's two major varieties of communication. Keep in mind the verbal and nonverbal. Um, all of us are using uh, both kinds all the time, and most of the time we use them simultaneously, okay? So that's, that's pretty much the norm. Um, if you're not aware of yourself using Nonverbal communication you do all the time. So every time you nod your head or smile at me, that's what you're doing. <laughs> so, all right. Um, so uh, track with me in chapter two um, on the paper version I'm reading here on, chat, on uh, page 26. Uh, the authors go through several uses of communication and this is very generic stuff, okay? But um, it's important because it helps us kind of frame this topic. And the first thing that they talk about is that communication uh, helps us to fulfill our interpersonal needs. And I think that's really important to understand. Basically, as human beings, we cannot live without communication. we got to have it. We have a deep need inside to communicate. And I think the point, the brilliant point that they make is they say that in, in most cultures, if they want to punish you really, really bad, they put you in solitary confinement which means basically you don't get to talk to anyone. Like even people in jail get a chance to interact with somebody else, right? Uh, but if they really want to crack down on you, they put you in a room where you're by yourself and people just go nuts. That's like, that's like the worst punishment ever, you know, short of just execution, of course. But people really do not like it. You know, it's something that they disdain. Why? Why is such a big deal? Well, because deep inside we have a need to talk to other people, to express ourselves, to share our thoughts, our feelings, our ideas. It's it's a interpersonal, inside, internal, almost psychological need that we gotta we gotta do it. We gotta communicate. So uh, and so that's the first point. The second point is that communication helps us with a person-to-person uh, -person perception. Uh, we can't not communicate because when we meet somebody, we want to figure them out, and the only way we're gonna figure them out is by communicating we start asking questions and kind of observing them and probing and and figure out what this person is like because it may be something that we're interested in the long-term relationship with that person or friendship and so you know the way we figure people out is through through communication by engaging with them um and that's necessary why because we're social beings we can't live on our soul, on our own so we need other people in our lives um uh, another uh, point that the authors make is that communication establishes cultural and personal identities. And this is really important, actually. Um, what people don't realize is that your personal identity that you have, uh, you don't just, you're not born with it. Uh, it's something you acquire. And how do you acquire it? Well, you acquire it by interacting with other people people that are around you. In fact, they help shape your identity. And so um, 
it helps you to know who you are, figure out who you are. And the only way you do that is by communicating with other people because you see yourself in reference to um, other people. So that's that's an important role that communication plays. And um, um, let's see, the authors talk about uh, communication having some uh, persuasive qualities. Well, and that's actually gets us down to the practical aspect. Why in the world do we talk? Well, most of the time, let's answer this question simply. Most of the time we talk because we need something. It is, communication is utilitarian. We want to achieve some sort of a goal, whether it be psychological goal, because I'm lonely, I need to talk to somebody, I need somebody to listen to me, or whether it be physical goal, hey, can you bring me a glass of water or whatever. We're, we're usually talking because we have some sort of a purpose. We have, we have a need. Um, and so communication has a quality that we're able to get people to do things for us. We can persuade them to do things for us. And it gets us further in the world. You know, uh, whether we're talking about persuading somebody to give you a job so that you can have a good living so that you can continue on, you know, or, or something else. In the end, we know that we can affect the environment around us by communicating. That's how we change things to fit us to help us to move us you know forward uh in the world so that's that's the idea uh we can move things in the direction we want them to so those are kind of um you know your big picture you know um uses of communication that's what we as human beings all use it for essentially uh, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, if you if you guys have a question, you know, feel free. Just stop me. You know, raise your hand or whatever. You know, chime, chime in. Let me know um, that that you need to you want to jump in on this conversation because I want to roll for a little while and I'll stop for questions. Okay, uh, there's some points that I like to discuss with you because I want really want to hear your opinions and feedback on. And some things are kind of generic, so I just want to get them out as a matter of recap because I'm hoping that you read the textbook and you know. Uh, but uh, on some issues, I want to have a little more discussion. All right, so what? how do we define human communication? What is the definition? Uh, there's really, uh, it's one of those difficult things to define because the moment you try to define it, it's, um, it's, it's really is a complicated thing. So defining something that simple, you know, defining culture, defining religion, defining communication, those are one of the most difficult things to define in the world. I mean, they're just, they're slippery like that. They're diverse. They're not the same. There's so many varieties uh, that it makes it very difficult to define, okay? So how do we define a communication? Well, the authors do offer us a definition of communication on page 28, kind of towards the middle of the page, across from the consider this box. And it's a very simple, very workable uh, definition of communication. It's rudimentary. It's not all-encompassing but it gets the job done, at least on this point of discussion, okay? And they say human communication is a dynamic process in which people attempt to share their thoughts with other people through the use of symbols in particular settings. That's still saying a lot, okay? I mean, if you break it down, this still says a lot. Dynamic process, you know, so we need to talk about what, what do we mean by communication being dynamic process? People attempt to share their thoughts, uh, you know, and with other people. So that's understand communication happens with between people, but they attempt to share their thoughts. That doesn't mean they always succeed in sharing their thoughts, but they try uh, and they use symbols. That's important. That's something we need to discuss. And then they do that in particular settings. So every communication, of course, has a context and the context matters a lot. Uh, so that is a fairly straightforward, simple definition of communication. But even within that definition, you could see how there's already a certain level of complexity, which uh, requires us to kind of unfold and unpack it and to make sure that we understand um, what that means. OK. So uh, so keep this keep this definition of communication that will come handy to you um, as you as you move forward. Uh, because you know we will build on this and then and then move further you know outside of this. 
All right. Um, in the next section, when the author talks about ingredients, uh, the eight uh, activities or the ingredients to human communication, we basically say that there's eight activities or eight components, let's put it that way, in a communication. This is something I really want you to know. Uh, we hit this in every communication class, um, whether we talk about human communication or interpersonal communication or intercultural communication, this is the basics, you know. If you take a business communication class, guess what? We're gonna, they're gonna talk about the same very components. Maybe they won't have eight, maybe they'll have fewer or something like that. You know, I'm teaching a public speaking class this semester and guess what? I'm still talking about the same exact components of communication because when we understand them, you know, uh, that's the key. That's basically the chart. So I want you to imagine, okay, uh, this, this visual, visual sort of say tool for yourself that these eight components if you can visualize them in as a picture it will help you out so the first component in communication is the source so whoever begins the communication is one like one person person one right all right and so because you know that there is a source there's got to be the person who is receiving communication there's two people communicating between each other okay so source is number one that's the person who essentially initiates communication there's some feeling that they have a thought that they have they want to share that experience, feeling, thought, idea with somebody else. So they open their mouth and they begin to speak. But before that happens, before that happens, um, before they actually start saying things, something happens with, with that source. That one person right there, the person one in the communication, has to take the thought that they have and they have to encode it into words. They actually have to choose words. They have to choose phrases. They have to think, uh, how do I say what I feel? What do I say? What do I leave out? How do I frame it? Do I do a introduction or not? Do I just blurt it out? You know, it's, the point is that they have to take what they're thinking and feeling and put it into words because you understand what you think and feel is not the same as the words you say. Sometimes the words are not exact. They don't quite express what you feel inside because you can't find the right words, you know, but but you have to encode it. And that's what we call encoding. You take thoughts, you turn them into words, all right? They almost like a code. Uh, and then you open your mouth, you start speaking, and that becomes the message. So now this encoded information is flowing in the direction of the other person, right? And that's the message. That's number three. So you have the source, the encoding, the message. Then you have a channel because when you're speaking, when you're communicating, it's not just always you speaking to a person face to face. Like here we are right now using internet technology, right? Our channel is Google Meet. Our channel is computers. Our channel are webcams, you know, things like that. That, that becomes our channel. Our, we, we're engaging what we call mediated um, communication because we're using something as a medium, something as a uh, something as a delivery method between us. So that's our channel, okay? We're, channel, we're using a particular means of communication. That yeah, I could be communicating to you through email, and that'll be another channel. I can be writing you a letter. That'll be another channel. I could be calling you on a phone. That'll be another channel. All can be doing face-to-face, -face, you know? it. All of these are different channels uh, of communication. So, <clears throat> so the source, uh, the message, the channel, I mean, the encoding, the, the message, the channel, then the next thing is the receiver. Now that we have the channel taken care of, whatever means of communication, now the second person finally gets the message, right? It finally got to them. So what happens with the receiver? A receiver has to perceive the message. They have to decode it. Because if I put my thoughts and feelings into, uh, into words, and you finally heard my words, and maybe you didn't even hear all my words, and maybe you didn't understand all of them, but whatever you did understand, however imperfect it might have come to you because the channel might have corrupted it or something, I don't know. Maybe your internet connection dropped out and you heard every other word, right? You don't know. But the point is, when that happens, uh, you are to decode what I'm saying, meaning you are to take those words and assign meaning to those words. And you are to try to understand what do I want to convey by those words? You could see how this process gets complicated now because I had to put my thoughts into words and you had to take those words and put them back into thoughts. 
on your end. Because words are just that words. They don't have to be perfect. So that's that's your sixth component is, is the decoding of that message that came to you. And then the other aspect is feedback. Feedback. Whenever there is a uh, message received, there's some sort of a reaction. There's some sort of a feedback. It may not be always visible. It may not be always obvious, but there always is a feedback of some sort. Now, most of us prefer feedback that is uh, observable, some sort of a uh, confirmation that we have been heard. So a person would nod their head, they'll say, yeah, uh-huh, something. You know, there's some sort of a gesture or acknowledgement of the message received. And that's what we're looking for. You know, some people will, you know, frown, other people will smile, somebody else will roll their eyes, whatever that may be. But there's some sort of a feedback. Sometimes feedback is verbal, sometimes feedback is not verbal, but there is some sort of a confirmation of being received and feedback flows back to the original source right so you have the source then you have the person receiving it and that feedback flows back to the source so essentially i'm getting a sense of how you are receiving my message maybe you didn't hear me and your feedback is what i did not hear what you say you know can you repeat that and that's your feedback and that's okay because then i know like okay you didn't hear me so i'll say it again uh and and then there's another component you know because if you think that that you know that feedback flows back and that's it then there's another um component to this diagram if you want to think about it so we call this noise in communication noise now what in the world is noise noise is anything that distracts you anything that takes away from the effectiveness it doesn't have to be actual noise it you know it could be something like a lawnmower outside your window or something like that it could be a construction noise from your neighbor's apartment it, it could be anything but it doesn't always have to be auditory noise it could be uh that guy is wearing a tie that just looks really awful i can't stand it it's so ugly and, and every time i'm listening to this guy think all i can think about is how ugly his tie is well, let me ask you a question. Am I really listening and focusing on what he's saying or am I being destructed by the fact that his tie is ugly? You get the idea. It's not always about sound. It's about whatever it is that's distracting me. Or how about this? Um, I, I didn't sleep all night and I'm tired. Uh, and here I'm talking to you and I'm paying attention, but I'm only halfway paying attention because I'm exhausted and I, had a terrible night and and i'm not catching everything you're saying because that's just how i feel that's noise anything that takes away from the quality and effectiveness of our interaction is noise my mind is running and i'm thinking about what i have to do today because i have a very busy day ahead of me and i know i'm supposed to be listening to this lecture and paying attention but my mind is really that I need to go shopping and I need to buy this and I need to buy that and my kids need this and, 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 and so I'm not focused. Why? Because my thoughts are distracting me. I'm not 100% you know, with you. And, and so what, whatever that may be, that's, that's noise. Any type of interference to the process of communication is noise. So, uh, so now you understand how really complicated this prospect of communicating, where you have that original speaker, the source, and you have the receiver, and what happens between them, how the information flows. It's not that simple. There's a lot of components that are involved. And so the breakdown uh, can happen at any one of those stages. Um, and that's what makes communication so complicated. And that's why as humans, we struggle with communicating while we need to communicate. It's one thing we feel like we have to, uh, on the other side, we all struggle with it and we don't always achieve our goals the way we want to, uh, because communication is a complicated process. So, um, and, and things do get in the way. 
so that's human communication essentially okay that that's the gist of it that's the if we were to look at a model that that is the model that i wanted you to see uh kind of in your mind and so if you, if you understand that diagram that i tried to kind of illustrate to you then uh then you're with me all right uh any questions on that so far are we good we're we tracking anyone okay sir i have a question about the receiver go ahead, yes go ahead paul uh so as uh can receiver of something not human because can i a receiver be not human yeah because i i i, I remember a, a movie the castaway i think the title of the title is castaway the tom yeah. hankers yeah he was cast cast away as an uh, island so he, he lived there uh, for, uh, for a long time so he right. he started to talk with basketball right a best basketball i don't know it was, it was like a volleyball yeah, volleyball. yeah, volleyball. yeah mr wilson mr wilson, yeah, yeah, wilson. Yes. Yeah. because it was made by wilson <laughs> wilson leather company <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> In that case, that the kind of communication is a human communication or something like another type of communication. I love your question. Uh, this is cool. Uh, so let me let me put it this way. You know that Mr. Wilson was not really participating in a communication, right? It, it's a ball. So um, he's really talking to himself, and he's making it up in his own imagination, just not to go crazy. So it really is not interpersonal communication, okay? It's what we call intrapersonal communication. Sometimes we talk to ourselves. I talk to myself. I hope sometimes you talk to yourself. Sometimes we need to sound things out, you know, so that, you know, we, we do that. Uh, so in order for interpersonal communication to happen or human communication to happen, there really has to be the at least minimum of two uh, people who are able to respond, you know, you know, the ball cannot respond. So he, ha he has to make the responses for himself because he needs those responses. Right. So it's kind of an imaginary scenario. So it's really isn't, you know, you know, so, so here's a question that's kind of related to a question. So when I talk to Google, do I, uh, do I talk to, uh, do I, am I having a communicate, a true communication experience? You know, it's receiving my messages, right? But it is a computer. It's an algorithm, it's a program. It has no um, sophistication to understand me truly. It understands data, it understands information. It cannot perceive my feelings. It cannot perceive my emotion. It cannot perceive any of those things that human beings can, okay? Uh, culturally speaking, no way Google can figure me out. So it, it, things like that, there's so many aspects and this is where human communication, communication really between person to person or person to groups of people is so different. There's really nothing like it, um, you know. And, and so an excellent question, you know, uh, I would say my answer is that not does that doesn't make it human communication, essentially, because it's one way. Uh, and he's just making it up on the other side uh, to 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 keep himself sane. So good question. But in that model, there has to be a receiver and that receiver has to be interactive and that receiver has to be real. Because you see that encoding, decoding part has to happen. And that's what a lot of times is not happening. So in, in scenarios like that, when people talk to themselves, essentially, that doesn't happen. All right, cool, awesome, great question. I love it. You make me, you make me think and remember fun movies too. So <laughs> Good um all right let's keep rolling uh i am on page 30 ladies and gentlemen communication is a dynamic process so we would get to this section of our um definition where we talked about we began saying that communication is a dynamic process so what do we mean by that what is dynamic and and what is the opposite of dynamic let's say it that way how would you explain that to me when the book says communication is a dynamic process, what does it mean? What's it trying to uh, say? I think dynamic is because it's having uh, all the time is changing. All with the time is changing with the culture, and it's um, depend on by the the search or culture or the environment. 
Okay, good, good. This, these are all good thoughts. So, Mateus, stay with me for a second. What is the opposite of dynamic? There's, there's another term that we used. When something yeah, is not static. dynamic, it is static. Thank you. That's yeah. exactly what I was looking for. So static and dynamic. So, uh, you know, uh, let's put it this way. Uh, I don't know. And we, when we go to objects, objects that can undergo change are dynamic objects. Objects that do not undergo change are static. They're stationary. They don't move. They stand still. They don't change. They're the same. Dynamic is constantly changing. So if I was to think in the world of physical forms that we live in, I would say, you know, something like, you know, rocks and water. You know, water is dynamic. It just changes its form and it adapts and it flows around. Rock sits still and makes everything flow around itself. So communication is a dynamic process. So when the authors say that, what they're saying it's a completely adaptable, it's fluid, it changes, it does not stand still. Uh, it's it's very flexible in by nature. While other things in life maybe not that flexible, but communication is. And so that's that's one of the things that they're trying to um, to say. It's always in motion. They say um, something interesting that the author says is communication is a dynamic process because once a word or action is produced, it cannot be retracted. Once you say something, it cannot be taken back, is what they're saying. Uh, nothing is can be repeated. If you make a speech and you try to make that same speech another time, it will be a different speech. Why? Because the feeling will be different, the crowd will be different, the words will be different. Even if you read the speech from teleprompter and it's word for word, guess what? The inflection of your voice is going to be different. You know, the emotion is going to be different. The setting is going to be different. The time is going to be different. Why? Because that speech was in the morning and this speech is in the evening and everything is going to change. So this is nothing is repeatable in a sense because we are temporal beings. We live in time. The moment you did it, you can't do it exactly the same way again. Why? Because, you know, as the famous philosopher said, uh, you know, nothing stands still. It's, it's It changes all the time. That's one thing that's constant that we have is change. So there you go. Okay, so that communication is a dynamic process. It's constantly changing. Um, and um, another component of communication is communication is symbolic. Now, that is an important concept to understand. Uh, we communicate in symbols. Uh, to us, a word is just a word but it stands really for symbol there's a symbol behind that word so i'm going to do a little fun uh, experiment with you guys and i do this in all my classes just because i think it's awesome uh, i want you to think for a moment and concentrate on one word okay and that word is tree visualize tree in your mind look at the details of that tree what that tree looks like Notice all the little intricacies. Zoom in on the tree in your mind. Visualize it in your mind's eye. Okay? Look at the, all the details. And now think about what kind of tree were you visualizing. So let's, let's say, um, yeah, just, just to give me some of what you saw in your mind's eye. What kind of tree did you see? Just tell me. Oak tree? Uh, a mango tree. Mango tree. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Did any one of you see a mango tree in your mind? Fabio, what did you see? Apple tree. Apple tree. All right. Anybody else? Sugar apple tree. Apple tree? A sugar apple. Sugar apple. What kind of tree is that? I don't know about that one. Um, it's like, it's from the Bahamas. Well, oh. so like it has... I don't know, like, how to explain, but it's sweet inside. It has seeds in it. Okay. It's like a little... Did your, did your tree have fruit on it? Yeah, so that, it, that's what it... Yeah, it's a fruit, I guess. Yeah. yeah so. so when you visualize that tree, did you see fruit on it? Yes, sir. So you saw fruit on a tree. Awesome. Anybody else? What trees did you see when I told you to visualize a tree in your mind? I thought of bamboo. You thought of a bamboo, okay? See, that's totally not like an apple tree or 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 a mango tree. 
So you saw bamboo, green leaves, right? Oh yeah, that's what that's where your mind went. Okay, that's that's all. Anybody else? What do you see? Peach tree. What kind? Peach tree. Peach tree. All right, another fruit tree. Did it have did it have nice leaves and and fruit or was it you know fall time? <laughs> yeah. Fall time. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? It's pine tree. Pine tree. Fantastic pine tree. <laughs> you guys, I love it because you're giving me such diverse answers. Pine. pine. Tree. Maybe uh, uh, what kind of what country kind of help me not hearing you? I, I said orange tree. Wow, I can't hear you totally. You might have to type it for me in the chat or something. <laughs> Sorry, Helby. I'm just I'm 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 wearing my earpieces and I still can't make it out. Awesome. Uh, let's see, Deborah. What about you? What kind of tree did you visualize in your mind when you visualize? Um, it's a big tree, yellow flowers, blue sky. <laughs> okay. So you you didn't just see the tree; you saw everything else too. Yes. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> I love it. So here's what I want you to think about. The only thing I said is tree. What did your mind do? Your mind didn't fill in all the gaps. And this is what, you know, you didn't actually see T-R-E-E, -E, okay? You didn't see a contour of a tree. You didn't see like a stick tree, you know, where I just draw a stick and then a little branches around it. And what you saw was the full image of something that what a tree means to you, okay? So to Mateus, a tree means a mango tree. Because that's what he thinks when he thinks of a tree, okay? To Paul, it's bamboo. To somebody, it's a fruit tree. And to Hyung, it's, a, it's like a pine tree or something. You know, we've seen trees of all sorts, deciduous, non-deciduous. The idea is that what I find absolutely fascinating that none of you actually saw the same, uh, same tree. That is awesome to me. The diversity of thought in just our small little, you know, gathering right here is amazing. And this is why communication is so difficult. Because when I say tree, you think of a particular kind of tree, of whatever that tree means to you. And I used a very simple image, right? But now imagine I'm using other words that are way more complicated. And each one of those words has a symbol behind it, has a concept behind it. And you are interpreting my words in your way that is unique to you. That's what we call encoding, decoding. This is what we call communicating through symbols. All our words are symbols. And that's why we have miscommunication essentially a lot because my symbols are different from your symbols. We don't get each other. So this is what the authors uh, mean when they say communication is symbolic. You know, that's that's what they're talking about. You know, it's an expression that's something that stands or represents something else. You know, um, and that's that, that relates to all words, okay? So um, each one of us attaches meaning to words. We are, we are the masters of meaning. Each one of us. We determine meaning in our own head, in our own mind, what something means. Means So that's the complexity of when we hear someone else communicating, we are trying to guess what they mean by that word. If we are very intuitive and good listeners, and if we're not very intuitive and good listeners, then we just say, oh, that's what it means to me. I have to assume that's what it means to them. But that's not a very good assumption because you see how diverse we are, even in our little gathering. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, symbols are, uh, the authors say they're discretionary and they're subjective. So they're, they're, they're not concrete. There's a little playing room there. And that's why, why one thing is connected to another thing in our mind is also not concrete because we make these connections between symbols as well. And so that's what makes it hard. Now, communication, besides being symbolic, the authors say it's contextual. Okay, so what is that? What do they mean by contextual? There's a simp there's a context in which it happens. There's a setting 
there's an environment. Uh, it's not in a vacuum. We don't just say words because that's what's you know going on. It's we say those words in a particular setting. So our classroom is a context. Okay, we're discussing communication, but we're in a setting, right? And and that setting will change. And depending on on how that setting changes, um, those words will be imbued with slightly different meanings. So for example, in a group, we have one context, right? So if we're using a particular word uh, and we're surrounded by many people, it's one thing. If we're just having a more person-to-person, one-to-one talk, that same exact thing said to a person in private may, may be understood a little bit differently. Uh, the environment in which we speak, the actual location, are we indoors, are we outdoors, you know, makes a big difference. Are we hot, are we cold? Um, the occasion on which we use words makes a big difference. Um, if we are speaking at a graduation or funeral or wedding, you know, or we're just having a coffee chat with our friends, that's totally different. Same words understood differently now because the setting has changed the occasion has changed and then of course the timing if i'm rushed for time if i have just a few minutes to talk to you and you called me and i'm between my appointments or something like that and now i know i have something going on i may be very rushed with my responses and i may not take my time why because i know i have other commitments that i got to run off to you know, whether if you call me in the evening and I don't have anything to do, I'm just sitting here sipping my tea. I have all the time in the world. We can have a nice, long, leisurely conversation. I'm not rushed at all. And I can hear you out and, you know, things are very different. So stuff like that, all of that affects the context, affects um, our words, affects the meaning, how they're perceived, how they're understood. And so all communication is contextual. It doesn't happen out of a particular context so whenever you hear something you have to say all right what is the context of that being said all right and that will determine the meaning the context will a lot of times will tell you what it actually means all right another uh point that the authors make in the textbook is the communication is self-reflective now what in the world they mean by that well basically they're saying that uh we are very self-focused as human beings, generally speaking. Now, there are some cultures that are a little bit, so, a little bit less self-focused, and there are some cultures that are a little bit more self-focused. But generally speaking, most people are always thinking about themselves in the midst of a communication. They are reflecting onto themselves, whatever is going on around them. They are seeing themselves as a participant, and they're always, even in the back of their mind, thinking, how does that make me feel? What do I think of that? You know, things, they're always reflecting within their own mind that has to do with them. Even if the communication is not their communication, if they're, even if they're not the source of the communication, they're making it their own by self-reflecting um, on what is being said. And so... That is the tendency of all communication, regardless of what culture you come from. Because as we are going to look at cultures, we'll see that some cultures are collectivistic and some individualistic. Some cultures are more focused on self and other cultures are more focused on group identity. But even in the group identity cultures, we tend to turn the communication personal and reflect on what, how it affects us personally you know, on that level. So that's... That's something to remember, you know, broad sort of say stroke about communication. Now, another point they make is communication is irreversible. We already talked about that. You cannot take your words back. You can't. So I remember um, um, years ago, I used to work as a court interpreter. Uh, on, and I worked at, at, at a federal case, actually. It was a pretty serious case. People were out, you know, for major felonies. And. And because it was a case that involved people who do not speak English, I was there to interpret in the court officially. And so I was there kind of running through what the person said. They were giving testimony. And as I am giving that testimony, as I'm translating, 
you know, they say it's, um, I don't know if you're familiar with translation, there's, there's a consecutive translation and simultaneous translation. Consecutive is when the person pauses and you say what they said, and then, then they pause, and then they speak again, and they pause, they speak and again. And the simultaneous translation is where there are no pauses. The person is speaking, and I'm speaking on top of them. And I have to listen and speak at the same time. And so here I am in a courtroom, and I'm listening to this person giving testimony, and I'm immediately interpreting it, okay, just like, like a cycle in my head. And then the lawyer stands up and he says, I object. Well, I'm not focusing on the lawyer. The judge then turns and says, sustained, which means the objection is valid. I am still not stopping. Why? Because the person is still talking and I'm still listening to that person and my mind is already running. So I'm just focusing on what they're saying. And they're both looking at me like, what are you doing? I just objected. And the judge just said, it's okay. And you keep going on. Like, you need to shut up, basically. And I'm like, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I am I am receiving and transmitting. And I can't receive from two more sources simultaneously. And so the judge says to the jury, he says, strike that statement. You know, basically, strike it from the record. So the court interpreter... You know, they, 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 they record everything. The court recorder basically goes and strikes it from the record. So whatever was said is pretend it didn't, they, nobody said anything. But the problem is the jury's already heard it. And I can't take it back. The person testifying can't take it back. And the jury cannot strike it from their mind. See, communication is absolutely irreversible. Once you say it, it's out. And you can't say, oh, no, no, forget it. Delete, delete, delete. You know? You can't say that backspace, backspace, backspace. It's like an email you're writing where you just backtrack and say, okay, I didn't write it. Once you send it, it's, it's out there. You said it, you could say, I take it back. Guess what? It doesn't work. Uh, don't ever say, I take it back. You may say, I'm sorry that I said it. You may say, I regret I put it this way, but you actually can't take it back. The, the notion is just fictional. <laughs> you, know, you can't really do that. Because by virtue of what communication is, it's not reversible. You can't make person unhear what you said, you know, and and that's that's done. It's done deal. So a good Chinese proverb over here, they quote here, says a harsh word dropped from the tongue cannot be brought back by a coach and six horses. So that makes sense. Maybe in your culture you have a proverb or saying that kind of goes along the same way. That you know that you cannot return communication. You have a saying, something like that, in your culture where you come from, maybe it kind of communicates that wisdom. Because that, that was that was like the Chinese version. So I tell you, uh, a culture I come from, we have a saying that a word is not like a sparrow; you cannot catch it. Once you let it loose, you cannot catch it. And that's just another idiom of saying that communication is irre irreversible. It's out. It's out. You know, it flies away free like a bird. All right. So communication is uh, also has a consequence. This is what the textbook says. And so uh, that means that it has some sort of an effect. Whenever somebody hears something, uh, they receive it. It does have some sort of a consequence or effect on them. It has some sort of response. Um, whether we notice it or not, is besides the point whether it's you know perceived is besides the point we may have a mental response to something we may ignore somebody somebody says something we don't like it we ignore it we don't respond to it but we actually did respond to it in our mind we chose to ignore it and we already judged it as with i don't like it i don't want to respond to this i don't want to say anything back but we already have responded in our mind so it has an effect it just may not be, you know, reciprocated and you may not even show it. You may pretend that you didn't hear me. I said something, you know, like, you know, like, you know what? I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to pretend I didn't hear it. But guess what? In your mind, you did. You already responded within yourself. And so there's always is uh, that sort of a response. And sometimes response is delayed. There's been times when people said something and I didn't fully understand what they said until later. When I remember those words, I'm like, oh, now I get it. 
And my response came a lot later, <laughs> you know, at least in my mind, but it was too late by then. You know, it's like, have you ever heard a joke joke and you didn't laugh? And then a few minutes later, like, I'm like, oh, now I know what they meant. But uh, and then you start laughing and you're and, and, and then everybody thinks you're crazy because you're laughing and it's in the wrong time and the wrong moment. So uh, I've done it a few times. So uh, another point that the authors make in a book is communication is complex. And so you already understood that, uh, that there's a lot of moving pieces. There's lots of bits and pieces in the communication. Uh, and there's so much that goes on in the background. Uh, and so now imagine as complex as communication between humans, just human to human, right? Just regular person to person communication. Now you add culture to that. And you make that communication, not just communication, but communication that is intercultural. Now imagine how that level, how that layer makes it even more complicated. Because communicating with people who are just like you or communicating with somebody who is close to you, somebody who has the same points of reference, somebody who has the same values and feelings and thoughts and ideas about life is one thing. We have enough difficulty sometimes communicating just between people who are close to each other. How much more difficulty will we have communicating between people who are really distant from each other when it comes to culture? when it comes to values, when it comes to priorities, uh, things like that. So that's what makes intercultural communication uh, even more complicated, even more nuanced process. And that's why studying communication is important and studying intercultural communication is probably uh, infinitely more um, challenging. Because now you have to become just an expert, not of how people communicate, but how all these cultures, you know, feel and think. And then you have to think on that and, and take that into equation. And that makes it uh, much, much more complicated. All right. Um, one more section um, uh, that I wanted to highlight with you guys. Uh, and that is the misconceptions about um, human communication. And we'll take a little pause, a little break, and see if we have some discussion. Um, there are several misconceptions that the authors list. And I don't know if you share that feeling with them, but this is what they feel it's important to highlight. They say that number one misconception is communication can solve all problems. Uh, that is one common misunderstanding that people have that if you just talk just if you have a problem just talk it out just start talking and everything will be work out well they say not exactly a lot of times talking is not going to do anything better in fact sometimes talking will make things worse but in the end you know solution uh, it does not always lie with just talking. All talking helps. Talking, getting your feelings out helps because it brings another person into, into the, if there's a conflict, it brings another person to a table. At least there's a possibility of working things out, but it's not necessarily going to solve things. And it's a myth to think that communication will actually solve the problem. It may help solve it, but it, it won't. It's kind of a Western view. It's a Western idea because Westerners put such a huge emphasis on communication. Uh, so Westerners think that communication in itself is a solution where it really isn't. Um, another myth, they say that some people are born effective communicators. And, and, and the truth is communicators are not born, they're made. All of us are born with certain character traits, and then we develop other parts of our personality and character identity as we grow up, depending where we are. But and essentially, if you want to become a good communicator, you need to become one. You don't, you're not born knowing how to communicate. I mean, when you're born, you don't even know how to talk. You can't express yourself. You learn how to express yourself with clarity and precision uh, uh, you learn how to express yourself with force sometimes uh, through culture, through environment, through learning, through picking up techniques, by watching others, by seeing how 
effective communication is done. And then your culture frames what is acceptable, what's not acceptable. So you always work within those parameters as well. So communicators are not born, they're made. That's why anybody can become better communicator because it's a skill like anything else. Um, that's, that's sort of say dispelling that myth. Um, it takes time to practice and that's really all it is. Now, some people are naturally just more, uh, their personality lends themselves to speak to other people easier. Let's put it that way. But that doesn't mean that people can't learn that skill. So, you know, even shy people can become great communicators. It's just a matter of training essentially. All right. So, um, uh, another myth, the message you send is the message received. Uh, that's, that's a good one right there. Just because you said it and it's clear in your mind what you mean doesn't mean that the person on the other end receiving that message actually understands it exactly as you meant it to be understood. Do not think that your thoughts and ideas and the messages that you send are not corrupted by the person receiving them. In fact, most of the time they are because our perception is imperfect. Because things, whatever you encode, uh, does not decode in exactly the same form as you encoded it. Until we have telepathy, until we're able to speak mind to mind, <laughs> bypassing everything else, we will always have this sort of uh, breakdown in not being able to communicate precisely everything that we want to say. Uh, so just because a person said it doesn't mean that the other person heard it in exactly the same way in which that person meant it. So that's a myth. That's a big myth. Uh, and so that, that pretty much sums up our, the conversation in the chapter that talks about the communication aspect of things. So the chapter really addresses two things, communication between humans as one part and then the aspect of culture in that communication as the second part. So we pretty much now covered the communication process between humans. So if you guys have thoughts or questions, you know, feel free to chime in. If there's something that you read in the textbook that you want to share that you're like, okay, this is really awesome. This was a new one for me. I didn't realize that. Or, or maybe something you didn't understand in the textbook that you want to throw at me, you know, feel free uh, to do that. I try to stay close to the textbook uh, as usual. Why? Because uh, the discussions that we have, whatever, you know, that's subjective. You know, uh, when it comes to me offering you our, our test or some, or some, sort of, some sort, I'm looking for my evaluation is based on, on your understanding of the text. Uh, that's what I really focus on. So that's, I think that's a more proper and more objective way of judging somebody rather than you know just talking about our discussion so so if you got something you know that you read in the textbook that you want to share shoot uh if you uh um if you have a question on a particular point the authors make shoot if i know how to answer I, I will answer if i don't know how to answer i'll tell you i don't so um i i don't come from a culture that cannot admit that we do not know some cultures have hard time they just make up the answer right <laughs> Uh, I come from a culture where I actually feel comfortable saying, I don't know. I'm not sure <laughs> because that's okay. Uh, I don't know everything about everything. All right, good. Uh, so let's spend a few more minutes uh, kind of uh, jumping into this idea of culture and then we take a little break uh, uh, for a few minutes and then come back, okay? You guys feel comfortable with that? You're still with me? Are you bored? Are you tired? You need some coffee? No, <laughs> you're okay. <laughs> You're okay with this? <laughs> yeah, maybe some coffee is, is Maybe good. some coffee would be good. Yeah. <laughs> All right, send some my way too. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, it's great class. Good, good. Listen, I love this stuff. I love culture. I love communication. I mean, these are things I'm, I'm passionate about it. I mean, you have to understand, you know, it's... For me, this is my forte. This is what I've been doing for many years of my life, um, communicating to very diverse audiences everywhere. And I love culture. I love learning about other people's culture. And I find it fascinating. I love to hear other people think in ways that I do not think. It excites me. And so to, to me, intercultural communication is really an awesome class because it lets, it lets me get into two areas that I absolutely love. So anyway, 
and and having you guys such a diverse crowd from all different places just makes it even more fun you know i i used to teach this class to uh to an audience that um that was probably like 98 percent american okay i've done that and it doesn't work the same you know it just i had a hard i had a hard time because a lot of times i'm always communicating to americans and trying to explain to them what foreign cultures are like and 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 most of them have never left their country before and i'm like struggling to explain things to them you know mm -hmm. uh, you guys are in a different place and, and to me it's exciting because you understand you know the diversity that's out there you know so uh a lot of times somebody who hasn't left the borders of their state i mean i've i've had classes with people who never left the state of georgia in their life like this is it. This I'm born here. I'm raised here, and I never went to Georgia. Well, maybe I went on vacation once to Florida, and that's it. <laughs> you know, that's about as far as they ventured out. Believe it or not. Uh, and so, when you have too many of students like that in your in your class, that that makes it kind of difficult to teach so <laughs> about culture, because everything is like, whoa, what are you talking about? I never heard of that. <laughs> so um, anyway, so let's talk about culture. Well, let's talk about culture. Um, there's several things in culture that we have to understand. Uh, number one uh, is that communication and culture are, are inextricably linked. Uh, there's a famous quote by Edward T. Hall uh, that every communication book uh, quotes. And Edward T. Hall is one of the early pioneers um, of communication studies and intercultural studies per se. And so he says this, communication uh, culture is communication and communication is culture. How about that? Culture is communication and communication is culture. Now, when he, when he says it like that, it kind of makes us think that these two areas are so interlinked, we actually can't split them up. There is no communication that is not cultural. And there isn't a culture that isn't being communicated because that's how we learn culture, through communication. So they're inextricably linked. Uh, another one is uh, another saying. This, this is by uh, Worded. He says, uh, culture is both the teacher and the textbook. How about that? Culture is both the teacher and the textbook. <laughs> uh, it, it's true. It's true. Uh, there's that powerful link between communication and culture that we really cannot sever. And... And everything we learn in life, you know, what we do and why we do it is defined by our culture and by how we picked it up through someone communicating it to us, whether they showed it to us, whether they, we observed it, they demonstrated it to us, or they actually taught it to us in school. It doesn't really matter. The point is we picked it up. So um, each culture that's out there, each people group, uh, each society, presents um, to its members, the members of its group, how they should think and how they should behave. Every group out there, um, every ethnicity uh, just teaches others how you should think and how you should behave. And a lot of times we don't like to think about it because we think we're independent. We think we just kind of come up with it on our own. But the truth is we're conditioned by our culture. Our culture teaches us how to think, what to think, what not to think about, what are the inappropriate topics to think about, what areas you shouldn't go into because that's forbidden, you know, and, 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 and it tells you just even how to behave because if this is how you think, if that is what you think, then therefore this is how you're going to behave. And culture does that. Now, um, Culture has to do with how we relate to other people. Culture has to do with how we believe, what we believe, what we think, how we behave, uh, how we view the world. That's another aspect of culture. How do we see ourselves and how do we see everyone else? That is what culture, you know, pushing us to articulate, to define for ourselves. And everyone is going to take a slightly different road in that direction. Uh, if you think about it, we're not born knowing those kinds of things. Uh, we don't know 
what we should say, how we should speak, what we should talk about. We don't know the rules, the norms of society when we're born. We're a blank slate, right? And we pick those up and we learn that by being participants in uh, whichever culture that we grow up with. And sometimes we're multicultural. Sometimes we grow up in multiple cultures. And that means we acquire this very nuanced identity of being in a multicultural environment. And we, we're being fed different types of messages. And sometimes they're a little bit conflicting, but we figure it out in the end, we form our own identity. So um, what is the basic function of culture? The, uh, the authors of this book ask a question. Um, and the answer that they give is pretty straightforward that the basic function of culture is to teach you how to adapt to your surroundings. Culture teaches you how to live well and how to survive in whatever scenario and surroundings they're in. When you enter a culture, there are certain rules, norms, and standards. And if you don't take cues on how to abide by those rules, norms, and standards and color within those lines, you're going to have a hard time um, succeeding within that culture. It doesn't mean you won't go on, but you will have a hard time becoming successful, prominent, achieving your goals. You'll have a hard time because either you're going to work within the cultural confines or you're going to be an outcast, an outsider, rejected, denounced, so on and so forth. And most people do not want to do that. Most people want to work within the confines of the culture within which they come up in the world. So culture can be very predictable from some from time to time. Culture can be, it follows patterns. It has set rules uh, and different cultures are different, but each of their rules can be articulated to a degree. Let's put it that way. So um, let's see, what is, what is culture? How can we define culture in a non-complicated way. The authors explain to us on page 39, they talk about culture defined. They say culture is ubiquitous and complex. Ubiquitous and complex. So here's one of those words you may have to look up, ubiquitous. <laughs> How many times do we use the word ubiquitous in, in, in English language? Well, not very often unless you're reading a communication book, right? <laughs> Written by professors <laughs> who are experts in communicating. Uh, and they get fancy with words. So uh, what, is, what is ubiquitous? Ubiquitous basically means um, pervasive. Pervasive. It means it just keeps on um, going. It is in everything. It permeates everything. Let's put it this way. Culture is permeating and complex. There isn't an area of your life which culture does not touch. Let's put it that way. That's what the authors mean by ubiquitous. Really, if you think about any area of your life, the culture touches. You're not being non-cultural in anything you do. The way you dress, it's cultural, dictated by your culture. The way you talk is dictated by The mate you choose is dictated by your culture. The drinks you drink are dictated by your culture. How much you drink, how often you drink is dictated by your culture. Everything, you know, the color you paint your walls is dictated by your culture. Whether you paint your walls or not paint them is dictated by your culture. Whether you even have walls is dictated by your culture. Uh, everything, and this is what we mean by culture being ubiquitous. It just penetrates every area of your life. And you don't always realize it because it's not, it's not something we think about. It's not something we sit around and say, oh, let me analyze myself. Let me analyze how cultural I am. We just, it's invisible. We just keep moving along. We don't think about it. But if we think about it, that is what makes us do what we do. That is how we live our lives. We are working within the confines of whichever culture uh, that we are participating in at that moment. Sometimes we have to adapt. So um, culture is notoriously hard to define. So I don't know if we're going to have a good character, you know, good characterization of culture that's kind of easy uh, to understand.
but um, it's very, very subjective, uh, very, very complex. So the best way for us to talk about culture is to talk about features of culture. And perhaps that will get us the closest we can to uh, what, what we mean. Uh, so the textbook goes through the different characteristics of culture. So let's, let's hit just a few of them and then we take a pause and we take a little break, okay? Um, so what are the main characteristics of culture? Uh, culture is shared. Um, culture is transmitted. Culture is based on symbols. So let's, what, is, what does it mean by culture is shared? Um, culture has common experiences that people within that culture basically all uh, experience. If they don't, if you're not sharing uh, experiences with someone else, then that's not culture. That's called personality. Okay. If you could say my culture is, you know, this and this and this and this, and then I turn to other people from your culture and I say, do you think that? And they say, no, he, that's just him. <laughs> you know, that's just her. That's just what he does. You know, it's like my culture loves rock and roll. No, not really. You know, you like rock and roll. It's not your culture. It's your personality. So culture shared. Uh, that's something that most people hold in common. Majority embraces, sort of say. And there are diverse cultures. Sometimes there's cultures within cultures within cultures. And that's that's okay. But the feature of most cultures is that they have components that are shared. That's what makes it culture and not just your personality. So there are things that we do uh, that are common to all of us. Um, all right. Um, culture is transmitted. That is one thing that happens. The, the way that culture is um perpetuate it, the way the culture moves forward, the way that it goes, continues to exist, is it is transmitted. We teach it. We transmit it from generation to generation. Kids growing up learn from their parents. And that is the only way that culture goes on. If they do not learn from their parents, nobody else, their society and their parents will teach them. But if they're not around it, that culture goes away. Okay, so... Uh, so I had a friend, uh, let's see, that, that I knew once. Uh, we kind of drifted apart these days, but a uh, long time ago, we were around each other, and he was adopted as a child um, from China. He's Chinese, ethnically, 100%. Okay? Looks Chinese, perfect, you know? But because he grew up in America, his culture was American. He didn't really know anything about Chinese culture, or even anything about Asia. He didn't, he didn't have a, even a sense about Asian culture, big picture. He was all the way 100% Americanized. And then in his adult life, he really discovered that he likes Asian girls. And he started dating an Asian girl. And all his life, you know, like he was always into American girls, you know? And all of a sudden, he discovered he really likes Asian girls. <laughs> and because he dated an Asian girl, he had to learn a culture. So here's the weird thing. A guy who is actually 100% ethnically Chinese had to learn an Asian culture. And the only reason is because he realized he's actually attracted to Asian girls <laughs> in the end. So you see, that's just a culture is learned. And we can learn it in childhood or we can learn it later, later on in our adulthood. But it's some, that's how it's transmitted. So I'm pretty sure that if he marries that girl, they're going to have kids and they're going to look Asian. And they're going to pass on their Asian culture, which for this guy is going to be a little bit challenging because he's still learning it. <laughs> he's still figuring it out. Uh, but that's what we do with culture. We transmit it from generation to generation. It begins at home. Then it moves on from school, society, playmates, you know, so on and so forth. So. We talked about symbols. Culture is based on symbols. So now when we say culture is symbolic, culture is based on symbols of our culture, you understand what we mean. So uh, if I flash a particular flag in front of you, that's a symbol, you know? Uh, but different people will perceive that symbol differently. When Americans sees red, white, and blue, they think American flag, right? 
when the Cubans see red, white, and blue, what do you think they think about? Not American flag, because Cuban flag is also red, white, and blue. <laughs> you, see, you see, this is not the tricky part. We have these symbols in our culture that mean something to us, but they're not always transmitting to another culture the same thing. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's like that. It, it could be colors, it could be images, it could be ideals, you know, how people perceive the world, but culture has these symbols that are built in. Uh, so we talked about that culture is transmitted, to talk about culture is learned, that nobody, um, nobody born, uh, is born culturally aware. It's something we pick up. Um, and we're, we have to teach ourselves what things mean, essentially. This is the important part about learning a culture. We have to understand if, if we are not, if this is not something we grew up with, then it's kind of almost, you know, subliminal. We just kind of know it. If it's not something, if we are learning a culture, then somebody has to explain to us, this is what this means. This is what that means. And, and that's the important part of learning culture. When we do this, this is bad. When we do this, this is good. And here's why it's good. And here's why it's bad. And so then the rest of the chapter kind of delves into this idea of how the, the, the culture is being taught, uh, that there's much of our culture is invisible, which is important to understand because it's, it's innate. It's not something that we talk about. It's something we act out. You don't learn many things in your life because somebody told you this is bad, this is good. What you did is you observed your society react to certain things a certain way and you figured out this is right or this is wrong by simply watching it, by interacting with your family or other people around you. That's how you, you know, think uh, things should be done. Nobody actually sits down and says, okay, when you have a problem, here's what you do. You go up to the person and you grab them by the shirt and you pull your fist back and you hit them in the face. You know? Like nobody actually teaches you that. You know, you do that. You solve problems with violence sometimes because that's how you see other people solve it. Nobody, you know, has a school of how to assault another person and get your way. <laughs> We don't need that. You know, we don't need to learn how to argue with somebody or, or be mean to them or how to call them names. These kinds of things we observe, we learn, and then we think that's acceptable or that's what you do when you're being assaulted. That's what you do when you this is how you react to this and this is how you react to that. Um, and these are all invisible parts of our culture. We, we don't even think about it. Uh, nobody teaches you that uh, kind of behavior. You just pick it up. Um, the, the, the rest of the section actually goes into a very long diatribe, which I don't know if you find interesting or not. Uh, I kind of find it sort of interesting, but then I get bored with it. Uh, it talks about learning through proverbs and learning through uh, folk tales and legends and myth. Um, uh, and then talks about learning through culture through art, which are all legitimate ways. Uh, what you don't realize, this is that these are, these are those parts of culture that we don't always uh, think about so much. Uh, we pick up so much of what we believe and think through the stories we're being told as kids, through the little, you know, pieces of art that we see. Uh, they communicate culture. Uh, they communicate values. Have you guys ever studied, have you ever had, had a chance to study Western art? Have you ever had a chance to notice how ancient Greek art, for example, all looks the same? Like all the statues. Think of all the Greek statues you've ever seen. What is one thing that they all have in common? Think about it. The I'm Greek? Give, Greeks, yeah, like Greek, Greek statues. Uh, the they are all naked. Thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for. They're all naked. Now, if this was a different culture, do you think they all be naked? <laughs> Probably not. But in Greek culture, they believed in the beauty of the human body. They extolled it. To them, that was like the most divine thing. So they, to them, the perfection of the human body was such a big deal that every person they depicted, even if they weren't so you know, good looking. They made sure that the statue of them was good looking and it was naked. 
And I mean, showing off genitalia in many cultures is not considered something you want to show off, right? But in Greek culture, perfectly fine. Let it all hang out. Well, worst case scenario, put a little leaf on it or something like that, you know, cover it up with a leaf. Yeah, that 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 happens. But but a lot of times they're all naked. So this is culture being transmitted and cultural values being translated through art. If you grow up around that, what do you think about nakedness? What do you think about human body? That is how you perceive it. And so your view of sexuality is going to be affected by this and so on and so forth. You know, if 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 all if all your art is about violence. If every art piece of art that you ever see is a soldier with a sword or a gun or something like that, then you're going to have, that's going to affect you. You're going to think that that is how things should be. So art is powerful. It sends us messages and it teaches us culture. So stories do the same thing and so forth. You know, um, it, we communicate that way. So that is one of, one of those methods of trans transmitting culture and learning and teaching it to to other people so songs paintings arts pretty much everything out there is fulfilling that mission of getting you thoroughly enculturated into the society which produced that art so you become to like and reflect those same very values by which you are surrounded and there's so many ways in which those values enter you it could be through food, like I said. It could be through songs. It could be through dance. It could be through how people hug or touch or how they stay apart and bow. You know, it's different. You know, uh, in Asian culture, people stand apart and bow towards each other, and in other cultures, they run to each other and hug each other. <laughs> Just different, different. Uh, but if that's how you grew up, then you feel more comfortable with, with that way because it means something to you. So uh, that's the proper way of doing things. All right. Uh, let's take a little break, guys. Uh, a stretch out, walk around uh, 10 minutes. All right. Uh, it's 10.33 on my clock. So come back at 10.43 uh, at and we'll jump in and I'll try to uh, wrap up uh, this chapter for you. Okay. So 10 minutes. All right. 